just want to say welcome to the webinar. It's the future of disc infection on site hypochlorite generation. And I'm Kevin Conway with Seward Equipment. A couple housekeeping items before we start, folks, is during the presentation, you're going to see six multiple choice questions to answer by poll vote. All right, what you want to do is click on the answer that you think is correct. And then after most of the answers come in, we're going to post the results and then move on to the next question. So there's going to be six of those. In addition, if you feel like you want to add your own questions at any time during the presentation, there's a question uh, drop down arrow that you want to click and then write in your question there. And as time allows, we're going to get to most of those towards the end of the presentation, but we will try to answer them. And then another one would be if you want to receive your PE credit for this webinar, it's very important that you have to fill out the survey evaluation at the end. So please stay on and complete the evaluation. We have to have that to get your uh, PE credit. And then you'll also be responsible for you to download the certificate of completion. It's a PDF of this presentation and it's available under handouts on the drop down arrow. And if you miss any of these, uh, downloading any of these, you can actually contact Sherry McNamara at Seawert or Kevin Conway at Seawert and through an email or whatever, we'll follow up with an email and get it to you. One of the other things is we're not sure if you've been to this presentation before as it's been given a couple times. One of the things that you want to check is in the presentations that you have attended over the last couple of years, just double check to see if you've sat in this or not. And the reason I'm saying that is you can't input the same seminar twice for your credits. So pretty much that's it for the announcements. And our presenter is Randy Otts. He's actually from Denora and he's got 26 years in the business. In regards to that, I'll turn it over to you, Randy. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to uh, meet with us and let me present. I'll also start out by saying sorry for the squeaky chair. Uh, so if you hear some squeaking in the background, that's just me moving in my chair. Uh, a little bit more about me. Um, like Kevin said, I've been in the industry for 26 years, uh, focused primarily in the municipal water and wastewater, chemical feed and disinfection, do have background in the uh, process side as well. Uh, do went to LSU, Louisiana State University, uh, went as a double E. Unfortunately, I'm a non-practicing double E. I haven't I've spent more time doing chemistry than anything else. So we're gonna dive into this a little bit. So we're gonna uh, start with What's the agenda we're going to go over? I'm, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the basics of chlorine chemistry. We're going to talk about uh, sodium hypochlorite degradation, that is uh, when you make a solution form of chlorine. Then we're going to go into on-site sodium hypochlorite generation, the basics of it. We're going to talk about the equipment side and the benefits, and then we're going to cover a question and answer session overall. So let's dive into this a little bit. We're going to start with the basics of chlorine chemistry. So when you look at chlorine, no matter if it's in a gaseous form, that's chlorine gas, a liquid form, no matter what the concentration, if it's a uh, you know, less than 1% that is on-site generated, you're commercially bought, uh, that's anywhere from 12 to 15 percent or even the forms that you buy in your local uh, grocery store or pharmacy or something of that that's about a five or six percent you still gonna or a dry tablet form when you take that solution that product and you mix it within water you're going to get two species which you're going to have of chlorine and those species are your hypochlorous acid which is the in this uh, representation, your stronger oxidizer and your hypochlorous ion, which is your weaker oxidizer. Both of them are oxidizers, but the hypochlorous acid is your stronger one. Now, the chart I'm showing right here is if you were like on your water or wastewater side, if you're going to take a sample uh, from like your typical uh, uh, Hawk analyzer that you take uh, a sample from, 
And within that sample, you are going to have what we're going to call a representation of this whole box is a representation of one milligram free chlorine. So if you took your uh, Hawk analyzer, you tested it and it said, all right, I have one part free available chlorine in that sample volume. Now, what is not shown in that is what's the stronger oxidizer within that one part free available chlorine. So on this chart, you can see to the left, you have zero to 100%. That is which species is more predominant in that solution. And then the lower part is uh, your pH of that solution. So the water that's in there, like your chlorine contact chamber on your wastewater side, or the pH of your water in your distribution network. So typically, uh, your water, typically most municipalities, both water and wastewater, you run between a seven and eight pH. Now, when you're looking at this, uh, when you're looking at that one part free available chlorine, you also have to take into consideration what your pH is. So if your water, no matter if it was the drinking water or wastewater, uh, if you're running at a seven pH, you can see on this chart that almost 80% of that one milligram per liter of free available chlorine is your stronger oxidizer of the hypochlorous acid. And then uh, the, um, the rest of it is going to be your hypochlorous ion, which is your weaker oxidizer. Now, if you just change pH by one factor going from seven and increasing it to eight, it almost flip-flops where only 30% of your hypochlorous acid is actually going to be your, your stronger oxidizer. But what's going to happen is no matter what happens in that pH, you're still going to show one part free available chlorine. So this is really predominantly strong when you're looking at wastewater treatment plants in a contact chamber. So, uh, so that was the part on the basics of chlorine chemistry. Now, of course, we have a poll question, your poll question. And, and since we're all isolated right now in our own little world, I decided to show a little poll question on your little mountaintop by isolation. And I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, good morning, everyone. If you just want to answer what you think is correct, um, we're going to wait just a few, like a minute or so just to get everyone to answer. Okay, half of you have answered. And while they're, the rest of you are answering, just a reminder, if you can see the handouts under the question, the little tab there, that's where you get your PDF of the slides and your certificate. Okay, a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close it. So what is a stronger oxidizer? Hypochlorous acid, hypochlorite ion, or water? And the answer is A, hypochlorous acid. So, okay. And uh, for my benefit, how many, uh, ever, what was the percent of? Oh. I'm sorry. It was 74% had the hypochlorous acid. All right. That's a good representation. All right. Thank you all for participating in the first poll question. Uh, this is kind of unique for me. I'm used to having uh, feedback from the audience, so I'm throwing me off a little bit here. All right. So now let's kind of um, kind of change directions a little bit. Now we talked about the basics of chlorine chemistry. Again, no matter if that was your uh, gas, your per, uh, in pressurized cylinders, no matter if it's commercial bleach, uh, household bleach, or on-site generated bleach, or your calcium hypochlorite, your dry form, the basic chlorine chemistries are going to react basically the same. Now let's kind of start switching gears and focus more on your sodium hypochlorites. This is your uh, your commercially bought, a high strength, your 
household bleach or even on-site generation bleach. Let's talk about the uh, sodium hypochlorite, the degradation of it. So when you're looking at degradation, uh, things you have to worry about is primarily the stability of your chemical. Now, of course, uh, some of y'all might already deal with uh, commercially available and even some of your household bleaches. When you first uh, open up like your household bleach, when you first open it up, you kind of get a whiff of, whoo, that's chlorine. Everybody knows what the bleach smells like. What that is, is actually off-gassing. So by, by default, chlorine wants to go to its natural state. The natural state of chlorine is a gas form. So that's what off-gassing is. Now, the problems with that is you have a couple issues you have to deal with. You have to all deal with the off-gassing, which makes it difficult to pump. So what happens is even uh, through pumping, the solution, no matter if it's in the tank or in the piping going to the pump, it wants to go back to its natural state. That's why you have a lot of issues pumping it because you have what we call air binding on the pumps. One of the ways to solve that is using pumps that don't run into those issues. A great example of that is a peristaltic pump or a hose pump. Uh, but the problem you run into with that is even though the pumps won't seize up anymore like a peristaltic pump, what, uh, what happens is it's going to pump that gas just like it would the liquid. The problem you start running into after that is when you pump air with water, what happens with the, um, the air? Does air move or does it compress? No, it compresses. So you can run into more slugging issues, which would really upset your feed rate concentrations. So off-gassing can make it difficult to pump, not just for the pump itself, but the overall control of the process. Now, the main issues you run into is degradation. And what degradation is basically is the loss of available chlorine. So that is what you paid for. It goes down. Okay, degradation, ha thing, two things happen. The degradation reacts uh, and converts your hypo that you purchase into chlorites, oxygen, and chlorides. Uh, so that is it attacking itself. Now, the speed of the degradation is a couple variables that you have to take in consideration. Is It takes in consideration the stronger your bleach is or your uh, sodium hypochlorite is, the quicker it degradates, also time, how long you store it, as well as the temperature you keep it at. So your temperature, time, and concentration, those three variables will affect it. Now, other things that will affect it, but not as much, will be how the uh, product gets delivered. Uh, if you have any impurities like irons or metals in the uh, in the tank itself, old product, a uh, pre-degraded product. So if you have a tank that has, let's just say, half the tank left over and it's degraded down, you put fresh uh, sodium hypochlorite on that. That degradation rate is going to accelerate because you have. Uh, degraded chemical blending with new chemical, uh, which will dilute it, but it'll also accelerate the degradation. Now, an example of this is when you're looking at this uh, chart I'm showing you here, is what we're saying, percent concentration, and I'm saying predicted because I'm using mathematical things. If you, if you start with 12%, you can predictably, depending on how you, what temperature you store it at, you can drop down within seven days to 8.24%, which would equate to a 31.31% uh, 31 drop in concentration, which means loss of your chemical, which is goes to the uh, the off gassing. Then it it, it goes to your, your chlorate formation, your oxygen and chlor chlorides. Now, of course, you can see the uh, longer you store it, the more it degradates down. So you can see on a 12% in 60 days, 
it's going to drop off to almost 90 96 percent of your loss and that's pretty much what we, what i wanted to sum up with is you lose chlorine you already paid for so if you paid for a 12 percent and it's degrading over time you're just losing money investment that you had you invested in a chemical that's degrading that means that buck 50 you paid for within a few days is not worth a buck 50 anymore because you uh lost so that means you have to use more of your money to compensate for that and the, the other things you have to deal with is you'll never know the actual concentration in that tank unless you do daily concentration tests you won't know what that is they say oh you're delivering it at 12 percent or 120,000 milligrams per liter but depending on the temperature you store it at and how long you store it at we can predict what the degradation is but you actually won't know and if you don't use any analytical meaning analyzers to control it you can't know exactly your what you're putting in so that's why i like to say it's impossible to keep residual at flow pacing only now fortunately enough this day and age people don't do as much just flow pacing only but there are some small small municipalities that still just rely on a flow meter at a well to feed in the chemical unfortunately if uh, sodium hypochlorite you could run into issues with that and now we're up to our next poll question. And I'm a mute. Okay, so we'll give you guys just a minute or so to answer these. Okay, just a few more seconds. We have almost 80% have answered. Okay. So it is, what causes sodium hypochlorite degradation? The answer is all of the above. And we had 90% who answered that. Um, so it's back to you, Randy. All right, great job on responding so let's uh move on now let's talk about an option that if you're looking at a sodium hypercolite solution that does not have the same degradation issues because uh one of the variables we're knocking out of the variable altogether is degradation and then the other variable we're taking out of the degradation is time. So the two variables we're taking out of the degradation is your the time we store it and the uh, concentration we store it at. So I'll get into the uh, part of this in a little bit, but let's talk about the uh, what it takes. So let, let's talk about what it takes to uh, to make your own chemical on site. So what you're going to need, the basics, these are the basics. So you're going to need three pounds of salt, 15 gallons of water, and two kilowatts of power. And what those combined make is your 0.8% or 8,000 milligrams per liter concentration of free available chlorine. Now, one thing you have to see is when I show this uh 15 gallons now that is your ratio so if you're used to feeding a 12 percent bleach or sodium hypochlorite solution you have if it's a 12 pound uh um you would you feed one gallon of 12 percent you're going to need now to feed 15 gallons of a 0.8 percent those are the rough ratios overall but the basics are salt water and power and what's nice about the salt is if you really look at the three raw materials you're dealing with salt water and power the most hazardous one you're going to be dealing with is the power and of course, fortunately enough, most municipalities already deal with equipment with high power issues. So realistically, as far as raw material, you have no underlying 
hazardous materials you have to worry about, unlike chlorine gas where you have to worry about the risk management progr uh, programs because of the raw materials you're storing, then uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite, 12% uh, uh, is considered a hazardous material, and, un and fortunately enough with on-site sodium hypochlorite generation, you're looking at a 0.8% and what's nice about this is it is actually not reg is not considered as a hazardous material by OSHA. So uh, we're going to ask the next poll question. Sorry, let's see. What raw material does it take to generate sodium hypochlorite? Give you guys a minute to answer that. Okay, give you guys a couple more seconds where 80% of you have already answered. Okay. And what raw material does it take to generate sodium hypochlorite? The answer is, I'm sorry, <laughs> I had the wrong answer, is the water, salt, and power. So it's the third answer. So 89% of you got that correct. All right. I, I would be sarcastic. Uh, hopefully nobody picked A. So, all right. So now let's uh, let's deal dig into the uh, process itself. What's going on in the cell? So what I'm showing you on this slide is the beaker, and it looks kind of complicated overall, but. I just like to show this to show you there are things what we really want. So when you take your salt, which is sodium chloride, the only thing we want out of that sodium chloride is really just a chloride. So uh, again, uh, we just want the chloride. So the sodium, the sodium chloride is this uh, section right here. So we're taking the sodium and chloride, we're dissolving it into water, and what we're doing here is we're the reaction that happens. Now, uh, when you're looking at what's going on within the cell itself, so if you look at the negative side, the cathode, this is the negative side right here. Uh, one of the byproducts we have in this process is hydrogen gas. Now, of course, when people think hydrogen gas, they go, holy cow, that's an explosive. You're correct. But what we have to look at is how much is getting formed and when is it getting formed. So the rule of thumb overall when you're looking at uh, hydrogen gas formation is the rule of thumb. So for every equivalent pound of chlorine that is produced in a 24-hour period, you're going to produce 1 35th pound of hydrogen gas over that 24 hour period. So within this beaker, let's just say we wanted to make an equivalent pound of chlorine. That equivalent pound of chlorine would take a 24 hour period within this, this beaker configuration we have here. So the, the hydrogen that's bubbling, again, over that 24 hour period, we would be seeing 1 35th pound. So as far as when you're the hydrogen that's being produced is being produced at such a low rate that it's not really that hazardous. Now that does not mean you do not need to take safety into, uh, into consideration because hydrogen is an explosive, highly flammable uh, gas, as long as you respect it that that is 
an area that you have to worry, not worry about, but you have to respect it. And most on-site generator manufacturers do have uh, intrinsically safe barriers. They have uh, venting processes in place to address what little hydrogen gas that is being produced uh, in the system. Now, the main part is on the positive side. So the positive side is the anode side. So what's, what's happening on the anode side is the basics are we're taking two chlorides from the salt, combining them together. And then what's happening here is because you're combining uh, the two chlorides, what's going to happen? Your sodium, the Na, is going to increase in that cell. So that's where you get the sodium uh, sodium hypochlorite. So it's the it's really the caustic side in the cell. Now, because at at the uh, the anode side, we are creating such a high what I would call a pH differential because right at the plates, within a few mils of the plates, the pH is 12. So if you if you have a solution that has a high pH that has any hardness in it, you're going to have what we call calcification at the plating. So I'll discuss how to address the calcification issue later on. But one way you can solve the calcification is using a higher quality salt. As I call it, you pay me now, you pay me later. But again, the summary out of the salt, the only thing we really want out of, that, out of the salt or the sodium chloride is the chloride portion of it. Now, another variable that plays into this whole process is if you're looking at the, the positive side, the anode, and the negative side, or the cathode, what we're actually having are two titanium plates. But if we put two titanium plates in there and apply a voltage across it, all you're going to get is a, a very expensive, uh, what I call oxygen generator, and you're just going to de destroy the titanium plates because of the way it is. What we do on the anode side is we have a, a precious metal coating on that to promote the chlor the gas the chlorine gas generation that's dissolving back in solution. And now we're going to talk about the overall process. So let's look at the sodium, the, the basics of the process. So here's your typical on-site sodium hypochlorite generation system. This is typical. Uh, most manufacturers have all these basic steps in it, no matter which manufacturer. So the first thing we, we're going to start is on the water inlet. So the, this is the water that's supplied to the system. And again, a few steps have to happen to make a good quality product. A few things we like to do overall, most manufacturers want to do, is we want to filter that water. Uh, most manufacturers like to use a five micron cartridge filter for most systems. And what that's doing is helping if you have any, um, any iron or manganese that hasn't been filtered out or any settlement, we want to get rid of that because uh, we want to minimize any impurities getting to the generator itself. So the first step we do is we filter it out. Now, when we get to larger systems, we will probably go to a bigger filtration system. Sometimes we'll use a media filter, but those are not the real, real big systems. Or on our real, real, real small systems, we might even do a residential RO system. But the first step is we want to filter it. The next step we want to do is we want to soften it. If you remember on the previous slide, I was telling you, when we're consuming those chlorides to make the uh, chlorine to dissolve, to make the uh, sodium hypochlorite solution, we're having a drastic pH change. And within that drastic pH change, if there's any hardness in that solution, it's going to calcify. So what we want to do in this process is we want to remove that hardness. So what we do is we go through a, a, a softening process. We typically use a two-tank two configuration. One's in service, one's in regen. 
and what we're doing is we're removing that hardness. We want to see our hardness going to our system less than one milligram per, uh, 17 milligrams per liter or one grain hardness, so virtually no hardness. Now, when we're leaving that softener, we're splitting that soft water into two directions. So the first direction, we're gonna go to our brine storage tank. This is where we're putting that uh, salt into. And what's cool about this process, when people think is, oh no, we've got a brine storage tank, that's another process we have to maintain. The only process you have to maintain is depending on the size system, you will have to put your raw material, your, your granular salt or, or your uh, household salt into a tank. And what's happening in that tank is we put soft water in there because we don't want to have any extra hardness into our system. And we're letting nature take its course. So we have salt, soft water mixed with the, the granular salt, and that's dissolving into a solution to make a brine solution. And what's cool about this is nature's great about making a stable, consistent concentration. So when you put soft water and salt together, if you see salt left over, you still have what we call fully saturated brine solution. Fully saturated brine solution runs, and I'm going to say roughly 26%. So 20%, 26% of salt can go into solution, and that's what we call fully saturated. Now that, when I say about 26, I'm saying 26.5 at ambient temperature, if it's at 90 degrees, it might be 26.8%, or if it's close to freezing, it might be 26.2%. That's why I say about 26%. Now, if you do what we call super saturation, if you get above 125 degrees of water temperature, you can get break the 26% saturation rate. But municipally speaking, you're going to have other bigger issues if you have an inlet water temperature above 125 degrees for your overall process. Now, the uh, the other thing we like to recommend is when you're dealing your, with your salt, again, what did I say on the overall generation process is hardness. Well, by nature, salt has calcium in it. That kind of helps bind it together. So what we recommend is a food grade salt that has minimum amounts of calcium in it or, cal uh, or, or calcium carbonate in it. So we recommend a, a food grade salt just to minimize your maintenance. So we made the brine solution. Now again, the other stream from the softener is going straight to that generator. And what we're doing this is we're taking that 26 percent brine solution that is made naturally and then we right before it goes into the electrolytic cell is we're taking that 26 percent saturated brine and we're diluting that down to about a three to four percent brine solution because we don't so we can make our product and then once we dilute it down within our cell we go through the electrolytic process that i showed in the previous slide and then we're sending it to a product storage tank now if you notice right in this little area right here by the generator this is when we start taking into consideration what little hydrogen is being produced that's when we start looking at hydrogen venting making sure we're venting that hydrogen so it's not accumulating in the room we make sure that the hydrogen what little is being produced is getting evacuated outside the building so we don't have any hydrogen accumulation in there and then we send it to a product tank and then of course after that it's pretty much like any liquid you deal with for chemical feed you have a metering pump and you feed it just like you would your other processes so on this one if it's a wastewater treatment plant uh, you inject it at the chlorine contact chamber uh, you use a residual for feedback loop or compound loop control to feed it in the only difference between on-site generation generated product versus a commercially available is your concentration ratios where it's a one a roughly one to one for 12% to a pound of chlorine 
whereas on-site generated is a 15 to 1, roughly 15 gallons of 0.8% or 8,000 milligrams per liter to equal one gallon of bleach or one pound of chlorine gas. Now, this whole process is a batching process. So our generation system, this whole, this whole generation system really could care less about what's going on in your uh, wastewater treatment plant or your water distribution plant. We only care about one thing, this storage tank, and we are a batching process. So when the tank gets to a low level, we have a level sensing on the tanks and it goes, hey, Mr. Generator, on-site generation, start feeding me. The generation process will start once we get to a low level in the tank. And then when we get to a high level in the tank, then we say, okay, we've got enough product, we'll shut it down. And that was a, so we are a batching process overall. Now let's get to our next poll question. Okay, what start and stops the generation process? Okay, a few more seconds. We have 80% of you voted. Okay, what starts and stops the generation process? The answer is storage tank level. Randy, that was about 78% and 22 had water flow. Back to you. I'm glad nobody said wind. That makes me feel good. All right, all right. So now that we've talked about the basics of the process uh, overall, um, I wanted to I'm going to show you some pictures of what I was talking about in the process. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see a small illustration of the process I showed previously. And I just wanted to show a few pictures. So when I talked about a water filter, here's an example of a water filter. And of course, what we do on a typical system is we will have a, a cartridge filter that you can unscrew just pull out the cartridge, put a new uh, cartridge in. And of course, the basics of this is we have pressure filters on, uh, pressure filters, pressure gauges on either side. So we can kind of determine when it's most optimal to change out that filter. So when you're looking at the overall process, what's one of the maintenance items you have to take in consideration is the water filter. And depending on what impurities you have in your, your supply water will determine how often you have to replace it. So I can't say you get six months or I can't say you get two years out of it without knowing what type of water we're getting supplied to the system overall. Now the next part is the water softener, what I was talking about. Now to me, this is a very key component to the system. Uh, the water softeners, again, are are self-sufficient. So, uh, so it, it's a resin-based system. Uh, so when what's happening is that a resin will absorb the uh, the the hardness or from the water, but it'll also remove some levels of iron, some levels of manganese and then some levels of chlorine but we don't count on it to do that it were primary reason it's there is to remove the hardness and what's cool about these the ones that we particularly use but a lot of manufacturers do is it's a non-electric process on top of the softeners there's a little gear uh, head on there and what we what is done with that gear head is when a system started up initially we will take hardness level samples of the water being supplied to our system. And what we'll do is there's different gear ratios depending on your hardness level. And what happens is that gear just, it's an old school gear, water passes by that gear, turns it, turns it, turns it, turns it. And when it gets to a certain um, turn, then it says, okay, this resin is spent we need to replenish it. So what it will do is it will switch 
to the tank that was in standby, then it will start to do a brine rinse. So it will take brine from the, the brine tank and then rinse that resin to, to clean it and also recharge it. So it's, it's a self-contained process. It does its own thing. The only thing you have to worry about maintenance on this is really your resin depending on your hardness levels, but a good rule of thumb is you're going to get a good five to seven years life out of the resin itself. Sometimes longer, sometimes less, but a good average is five to seven years. And the, really the only maintenance you have to worry about, and it's not really a maintenance, it's more uh, what you have to take and can, uh, is the waste stream. So the only waste to the overall generation process is from this softener because of the softening process. And when we do a backwash, we we'll have to rinse that resin. So you're going to have re what we call softener reject uh, from the softener itself. So that will be a high salt concentration of waste that needs to go to a sanitary sewer. Now, some some areas like in California and some parts of, of Texas, that can't be disposed of. So what they do is they'll have, they will know what size volume that, that cylinder or or tank is and make a drying bed so when the re when it goes through a backwash it goes to this drying bed and then they will scrape it up periodically afterwards of any uh residue but most of the time it could be go to a sanitary sewer uh, most municipalities are large enough to where the salt level that's in this reject is not enough to affect the overall wastewater treatment process. Now, the next part is we have what we call the brine tank. Now, there's two different levels of brine tank depending on the size system you're dealing with. Most rule of thumb is if you're doing a system that let's just say is an equivalent of 100 pounds per day of chlorine gas and below, you are probably going to be able to be into what we call a, an open lid bag loading system where you would manually uh, load in 50 pound per day bags. Now, you can get away with a more expensive option of a silo. But most of the time, this is the most economical approach. Now, when you get above 100 pounds per day, that's when we start looking at silos. And what a silo is, it's just a huge, big, you know, typically just a six foot diameter by 10 foot tall silo, and you get your salt delivered in bulk form where an 18 wheeler will pull it up and pneumatically blow it into the top of the tank. If some of y'all are familiar with lime applications, similar process, the truck comes in, they pneumatically blow the salt into the tank. You have to have, uh, you know, right over here, you can look right here, this is a dust arrester. So when we're pneumatically blowing in, you're going to have the air come out and we'll put a dust bag on the end to minimize the dusting that happens. But what's cool about this uh, on the brine silos is we're not really filling the liquid all the way up. We'll have the liquid level about at the five to six foot level because we don't need to fill up the whole tank. Now the whole tank will be filled with salt, but we'll have what we call a, on both the uh, small open lid tank and even the brine silos, we have what we call a wetting ring. And it goes the whole diameter of the tank. And when we're, we need to add more water to the tank, it will wet in, the, in a circular diameter to help erode the salt evenly down as well. And so that is really the basics of the on on, of the system. I'm not going to talk about the generators themselves primarily because you know, there's different manufacturers out there and I want to keep it as neutral as possible. So I just wanted to talk about the basics of the generator and then the, uh, the storage tank. It's a storage tank. Uh, the only difference is instead of having a truck come in and pump in your chemical, the generator is sending the product to the tank itself. And I'm not going to talk about the injection system because that's pretty basic. Now, I do want to spend a second to talk about uh, retrofitting existing 
clientele. So this is an example of your typical, let's just call this a thousand pound per day system and retrofitting. So things can be retrofitted. So this is your typical chlorine gas cylinder room uh, that has, and it can be easily retrofitted into a chlorine generating room, sodium hypochlorite generating room uh, in here. So these are your storage tanks back here. Uh, these are the generators right here. Uh, overall, I'm not, not going to stay neutral, so you can see the, come on mouse, work with me. Sorry, my mouse, there we go. So it, the before and after, the only, the only thing that was done within this building was the cylinders were taken out, uh, put a new fresh coat of paint on the walls, did some uh, kind of, we uh, had to fill in the trench here from underneath the ton cylinders, but very clean installation. So it can be, most of the time, it can be retrofitted. Uh, of course, on-site generation overall is a very clean process. It, it doesn't get messy overall. Now, again, it's like any piece of equipment, the better you take care of it, the cleaner it looks. If you don't, if you don't take care of it, the dirtier it looks, the messier it looks. But overall, on-site generation, no matter which manufacturer, it's a very clean uh, installation, very clean to easy to maintain. And if you can see on this particular installation right here, what's cool is about on-site generation in the uh, most states have a 30 day of chemical storage. Well, this client up here in the upper left hand corner had that requirement, but we maintain that with a pallet of salt in the generating room and not mandate that the brine tank right here have to hold the 30 days of salt, as long as the 30 days was within the generating room. So that just makes life easier and helps reduce the overall capital cost of it. Now, of course, what I want to show right here is the on-site sodium hypochlorite generation, a typical layout of a generator that pretty much is what I would call a similar look and feel of this system right here, but to kind of give you what does it look like real estate wise. Now to fit this in comfortably and have elbow room like you saw in that uh, previous picture, a 14 by 14 foot room will give you everything you need from salt storage, your uh, other electrical, your injection system, softening, brine tank generator, oxidant tank for a 50 pound per day system. So a typical 50 pound per day system you can fit within a 14 by 14 uh, room. Now, of course, you can get creative on room layouts to shrink this down, but if you wanted a ton of elbow room, this is the way to go. So now the other area I really wanted to focus on is really the benefits of on-site generation compared to chlorine gas or commercially available uh, sodium hypochlorite is uh, let's talk about some of those benefits. So there's three major benefits to on-site generation. You, the, it's the safest investment because it, because of the bleach or your sodium hypochlorite cost stability the transportation, and, a, and it actually has an attractive payback when you really do a detailed analysis. So when you're talking about bleach stability, I haven't been tracking this data since 2010, uh, but you can kind of get a good indication of what we're doing here. So if you look at these, these graphs, this is actually true data from uh, the PPI from the US government from 2005 to 2010. So a few things we have, we're, the blue, dark blue right here is caustic. The, or, the orange line right here is chlorine gas. The red line is bleach, your commercially available bleach. The green is salt and power. So if you look at the salt and power, it from if you're thinking about it strictly from an economics of long-term forecasting. So if you had to, somebody said to you, hey, I need to know within five to ten percent what your operating costs for something is 
salt and power, you can be pretty consistent and say, I can feel pretty confident. I can forecast out a good five, you know, five to 10 years and know what my operating cost of that raw material salt and power would be. Now, if you look at the chlorine gas and your bleach, look at that spike we had late 2008 you know that was like holy cow and then it dropped off the plane but from it, from somebody that has a sodium hypochlorite system a bleach system that if somebody said in 2005 what your cost would be in 2008 they would have said they would never have guessed it would have gotten that high so when you're really thinking about the benefits uh uh you know for long term planning salt and power as part of the on-site generation is really an easier way to do some long-term forecasting. And of course, things that some people don't talk about, but it is an impact, especially in this day and age, when you're looking at how many personnel is on your site, safety and security, when you're looking at bleach, having bleach delivered versus salt getting delivered. So when you get a delivery of bulk bleach, you a few things you have to worry about well you have to have the driver come in you have to have uh, a operator or plant personnel be with them at all times and at time it takes to unload so it, it's really roughly a four to one ratio so if you really start to take in consideration how much time and energy that plant personnel have to spend with the chemical guys go into on-site generation you just reduce that interaction so that reduced how many times a non-employee is on site. That reduces how much time your employee has to babysit a, a non-employee person while they're on site. So that's something also to take in consideration. That's really not calculable, but it can, can add up over time. Now we have another poll question. I, I went a long stint <laughs> before a poll on this one. Okay. Give you guys about a minute. What are the benefits of on-site generation of sodium? This is a trick question, though. Okay, just a couple more seconds. Um, we're about 80% have answered. All right. Okay. And what are the benefits of on-site generation of sodium? The answer is, I said it was a trick question. I'll have Randy explain why. Cost stability and transportation cost. So either one, 77 did cost and 14% did transportation, Randy. All right. Well, the reason why I wanted to kind of put it as a trick is, again, there's a lot of people out there that that think just cost only and then other people think transportation only. And it's actually both. So that's why I like to kind of throw that trick in there. So both whoever answered, you know, the cost and whoever answered you were 50 percent right from my point of view. Now, of course, I'm I'm happy to report nobody pick nobody picked B or at least they didn't say it out loud. So, and it also depends on what salt that is purchased uh, can be taken home, but all right. So now let's talk about the final leg of it. Now, this one, I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit because I just now realize I'm starting to run out of time now. So let's talk about the payback of, of on-site generation. Now, I will let you know that on-site generation out of the three technologies, even the fourth technology, uh, you know, uh, commercial bleach, gas, or Cal Hypo, on site generation is going to be by far the most expensive capital expenditure compared to the other three options. But if you really take the whole life cycle into account, on site generation is very has an attractive payback. On this ex example, we're, I'm going to be showing you right now, I'm going to be comparing a 50 pound per day system over a 15 year period 
compared to uh, commercial hypo. So the commercial hypo on this example, they're getting their 12% at a buck 90 per per pound or per gallon equivalent. Now what their what their raw material costs are. Their cost of salt is 24 cents a pound and their cost of power is 0.09 cents per kilowatt and their labor burden rate, their internal labor cost is 50 per hour. Other variables I'm taking into this consideration is your temperatures that you're storing your sodium hypochlorite at that you purchased. The spring, it's going to be stored at 80 degrees, summer 97 degrees, fall 70, winter 50. That's more of a middle climate. Further north you go, those will probably get less and below. Now, if you look at the first slide I'm going to show you, uh, on-site generation roughly 55K or 55,000. On-site sodium hypochlorite generation was an existing system that the customer already owned, so there's no capital uh, expenditures. Now, of course, I'm a regurgitate of the of your uh, uh, everything that I told you about your consumables. But what's cool about this life cycle is, so the life cycle cost over that 15 year period on site generation was $342,243. The sodium hypochlorite with no capital expenditure was $657,169. That's a difference of $314 and uh, $314,906 over that 15 year period. And the best alternative based on this is really on site generation. Now, how did I come up with these numbers? Hey, glad you asked. So let's look at that a little bit. So, Let's talk about the the pay the cumulative payback. So what we're looking at, this is your cash flow. So this is how much you spend year over year into the on-site generation and your your cumulative uh, compared to what you would spend on your current system. So what we're saying is the net present value, meaning uh, how much money you spend on this 314, your payback period is 2.2 years. Your rate of return is 55%. So that's not a bad payback for this example. And how did we get these numbers on the cash flow? Let's look at that. Now we're going to put side by side. So we know, like I told you, we had a $55,000 investment on the on site generation at year zero. So that goes all the way to a negative cash flow for this example. Uh, no on year zero for your sodium hypochlorite, there was none, so zero. Now, things we're talking about here is we have your cost of power. And if you notice, we're taking that interest that I was telling you, inflation year over year, we're adding that to every year. That's the power we use, the salt, how much salt we use year over year. RI is items we have to replace for the on-site generation and your PM is your maintenance cost. Now, preventive maintenance. Now, on the operating cost, your hypo, this is your cost of your hypo per year, your raw material and your maintenance. And of course, that's how we got the cash flow over the over the net present value over the full 15-year life cycle of buck 25 for the on-site generation versus the 2.4 uh $2.40 for the uh on-site, I uh, mean, sodium hypochlorite. How do we get those numbers? When you really dig into it, so when we talk about the power, we're taking how much you pay for power, nine cents a kilowatt. How many? How much? What's the? How much power does it take to make the uh, the product over that annualized price? Of course, sodium hypochlorite. We didn't have any costs associated because you just bought it outright. Now, if we had some temperature compensations, your water temperatures, this area right here we would uh, populate with, if you had to cool the water down, that would add the cost of a chiller, power to run that chiller. If you needed to warm up that water, that would take, we would calculate how much it costs for you to run that water heater to warm up that water. But for this example, we were right in the target range, so there's no water or heater needed no chiller or heater needed for this now we get into the chemicals so we said 24 cents a pound for salt so three cents per pound uh, 
yourself for 50 pounds per day for a full year, you're going to spend 13,140. Now, when we get to the sodium hypochlorite, it gets a little tricky because I needed, I started to take in consideration that nobody really does is the chemical degradation that I was talking to you earlier, which is concentration, temperature, and time, those three variables. Well, on this page, we're showing you the first variable, the concentration of how much you pay when it gets delivered. So you're so you're paying a buck ninety a gallon delivered at 12% on day one. But the next slide, I'll show you how I came up with a calculated much. So if you did the math, it wouldn't line up because you're not taking into consider the, uh, the degradation. Now, here's where we came up with the maintenance items, how much time and parts and pieces you would spend. And again, on this example for the brine pump in the generator would probably be needed replaced in five years. I take in consideration uh, your PLC, you might have to do maintenance on your PLC in 10 years and your cell might need to be replaced in your generator in 10 years. Now, the other variable I wanted to uh, focus on is the degradation of how I came up with the, uh, the product. So what I'm doing in this example is showing you if you stored 30 days of storage for 50 pounds per day. So if you had a 50 pound per day system, this would be 30, so this would be an equivalent to you having a 1,500 gallon storage tank that a, a, a chemical company would come deliver 1,500 gallons of 12% so you can feed 50 pounds per day for 30 days. And in the springtime, you would start at 12%, which would equal 5.04 gallons an hour, a gallons a day, but at day 30, you would be at 10.3% if you stored it at 81 degrees. And then, and this is what I'm doing, is taking consideration the predicted degradation rate based on temperature time of the half-life of chlorine. So at 90, if you store that 12% at 97 degrees, within 30 days, it's gonna drop to 7.31. Fall, if you notice fall, 70 degrees, you barely have any drop. The sweet spot, just as a uh, reference, the sweet spot to minimize your chemical degradation and bleach is 65 degrees. If you can keep your uh, indoor temperature below 70 degrees, you'll minimize your degradation of your chemical. But I'd like to show the attractive payback overall. Now, this one's I went fast, so I don't know how many people will get this last one. Actually, since we're um, short on time, I have a couple questions that I think we would rather go over than doing the last part of the Yes, Sherry, I can. Okay, I'm ready. Next question is regarding the. Yes, Sherry, I can. How does the chlorine get converted to the hypo ion acid? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm having a hard time hearing that question. The first question is regarding. The generation principle. How does the chlorine get hypochlorous and acid? I'm sorry, I that was breaking up. I'm sorry. Okay, I I'll read it. Um, regarding the on-site generation principles. How does chlorine gas get converted to OCL and HOCl, the hypochlorous ion and acid, so that it stays in solution? Uh, that, uh, man, okay. On, on that one, uh, it's starting to get a little bit above my chemistry pay grade. Uh, that's a great question. Okay, so how does it stay into solution? Uh, how does it get converted? How does it get converted? Oh, that—that that is um, really it's depending on your uh, pH. So you have a symbi symbiotic relationship with your. So when you put chlorine in solution, you are going to make uh, the hypochlorous ion and acid. That it, that is going to be made. Though which is predominant, meaning 
is the pH. So if you, let's just say you put one, one milligram into solution, your solution's at seven, and it's going to be 80% hypochlorous acid, roughly 20% uh, uh, the ion. If you don't change your concentration, you just change your pH, your speciation will change, but the, so the, but the chlorine won't change. It's just what makes it, the pH is determining how strong of an oxidizer you have. Did that answer the question? We'll see if he comes back with anything. Um, next question is where do the other process byproducts go when they leave the generator? Randy? So let me go back to that slide myself so okay. I can walk through it. All right. So when you're looking at these other ones, so you have the, uh, the chloride that gets combined to uh, the chlorine, the sodium that stays in there that's just makes your sodium chloride. So that will what makes your pH concentration of your solution. So that's why on-site generation is roughly about a nine pH. Uh, chlorine gas stay, gets into the solution. Your uh, hydrogen gas, that is vented out. The high hydroxy ion, which is your, uh, um, which is part of your, uh, that's more of your P, uh, part of your pH, and E is electricity. So within this process, the sodium chloride, when it's combined, is just converted. Uh, it's the inner, the matter's not being uh, destroyed. It's just being converted from one for chemical formula to another, using power as that uh, catalyst to change those uh, those chemicals. Okay. The only waste product, again, is the hydrogen and what little bit of oxygen is being produced. Okay. And then the last question is, what is power consumption kilowatts per 100 pounds? Right. So 100 pound per day generator. So the basic way you determine how much it takes to uh, make 100 pounds of chlorine for power wise. So we said it takes two kilowatts per pound. So you're going to say 100 times two equals 200 kilowatts. But that's not all at once. That's over a 20 over a 24 hour period. OK, that was the last question. Um, so I get, we'll wrap it up. Uh, your survey will be up as soon as we just turn this off. And then um, the handouts, you can download them. I'll give you a couple seconds to download them. If you miss it, it will be in your email tomorrow, um, your follow-up email. So thank you very much for attending. Randy, thank you so much for presenting this for us. And Kevin, thank you. And everyone have a wonderful it. day. All right, thank you all for all attending. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Bye.